morning. It's good to see everyone this morning. Well, I will uh, I'll go ahead and tell you, uh, confess a screw-up that I made in the first service. Uh, you guys, actually it wasn't a screw-up, it was on purpose. Uh, the first service pays attention better, and so I didn't fill in the blanks on the PowerPoint, uh, but they complained and, and thought maybe you guys, since you don't pay attention as well, needed, the, needed them filled in. No, I tell you what, uh, so Jacob Harper comes through the line and says, hey, I, I'm going to bust burst my dad's bubble, but you didn't fill in any of the blanks on the PowerPoint. It's like, oh, no. So, yeah, well, that, that too, <laughs> whoops. So, they will be filled in for you. Hopefully, uh, you can follow along with me this morning. Uh, and I, I do, I want to welcome you back to the Mark series. It's week 11, okay, and we are finally finishing chapter 3. Yes, this is, this is great. This is great. Uh, I, I joke, but honestly, I hope you guys are appreciating and enjoying the series as much as we are. Uh, not just, not just the content of the series, but the pace of the series. Uh, it, it's really healthy and beneficial to go through scripture this way. Um, it gives us a greater understanding of what God is communicating through his infallible word, and it gives us a greater understanding of what God desires for us uh, as we try to walk in obedience to him. Uh, so instead of doing uh, large chunks and, and glossing over things, really diving into uh, what God's word says and, and uh, pulling out the deeper uh, stuff that's there. So, so we appreciate the pace. We hope you guys do as well. Um, another thing this pace does is it helps us to recognize some of the unique styles uh, that the authors have, okay, some of the unique tools that they use. Um, so last time I preached, we talked about uh, character development. Mark does a great job of developing characters and using those characters to teach us uh, about Jesus and, and how we interact with Jesus. And so it helps us to uh, see better how we relate with Jesus. Today, we, we looked at three characters last week, and today uh, we see that Mark, again, is a good Baptist preacher as he uses three different groups or three different points uh, in succession to get his point across, right? And so today, we're going to look at the three different kinds of people, not necessarily a character study, but three different kinds of people, uh, and we're going to look at what they knew about Jesus, which determined the way that they related with Jesus. So if you would, turn to Mark chapter 3 with me. We're going to start in verse 20, and when you get there, stand with me, if you would, uh, for the reading of God's Word. Again, if you can't, totally understand. Uh, but we're going to read starting in verse 20, and go all the way through the end of chapter 3. So let's read. One time Jesus entered a house, and the crowds began to gather. Soon he and his disciples couldn't even find time to eat. When his family heard what was happening, they tried to take him away, saying he's out of his mind. But the teachers of religious law who had arrived from Jerusalem said, He's possessed by Satan, the prince of demons. That's where he gets the power to cast out demons. Jesus called them over and responded with an illustration. How can Satan cast out Satan, he asked. A kingdom divided by civil war will collapse. Similarly, a family splintered by feuding will fall apart. And if Satan is divided and fights against himself, how can he stand? He would never survive. Let me illustrate this further. Who is powerful enough to enter the house of a strong man like Satan and plunder his goods? Only someone even stronger. Someone who could tie him up and then plunder his house. I tell you the truth, all sin and blasphemy can be forgiven, but anyone who blasphemes the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. This is a sin with eternal consequences. He told them this because they were saying he's possessed by an evil spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him. They stood outside and sent word for him to come out and talk with them. There was a crowd sitting around Jesus, and someone said, Your mother and your brothers are outside asking for you. Jesus replied, Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Then he looked at those around him and said, Look, these are my mother and brothers. Anyone who does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Let's pray. Uh, God, I, I thank you uh, for the opportunity to gather together as your, as your body, as your family, and, and worship you this morning. Uh, I thank you for your word that you've given to us and the fact that it is 100% truth. Uh, and I pray that you would uh, use me as a vehicle this morning to deliver the truth, uh, but, Father, that uh, you would remove me from it, and it would be you speaking uh, so, that, so that your spirit could move and, and we could uh, see lives changed because of, because of your word. Uh, and so, Father, I pray that you bless the rest of our time together, and, and I pray that you would 
I just bless the message. So I'm going to pray. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. All right. Like I said, we're going to be going over three different people groups. Okay, three different groups in this section. Uh, and the first one is the oblivious. Uh, but first, before we get even into that, we have to introduce the family. Okay, and you'll notice on your outline the family is the third group. I'm talking about a different family. Uh, this is Jesus's like biological family. Okay, uh, Jesus's family is brought up twice in today's passage, um, but in in verse 21, it's it does not specifically family. Um, the the word could be more actually accurately translated uh, his people, but because of verse 31 bringing his family into it, it's really safe to assume. Uh, and this translation assumes that family is indeed uh, the culprit that thinks that he's crazy uh, in verse 21. Uh, so uh, his family uh, is, is on their way uh, to see him, his mom and half-brothers, uh, because they think that he's lost his marbles. Okay? So we have to talk about his family. Why, why is this the case? So first let's look at Mary. Uh, Mary obviously believes that Jesus is the Messiah. How do I know? Well, because... Whenever Gabriel came and spoke to Mary before she was pregnant with Jesus, he said this, You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. Okay? Uh, so, uh, in my thinking is, if this virgin girl, who, who before becoming pregnant, or becoming pregnant while still a virgin... Uh, isn't convinced that Jesus is the Messiah, like Gabriel said, okay, uh, the Son of the Most High, uh, inheriting the, king of the, the throne of King David, reigning over Israel forever. If this isn't enough to convince her uh, that he is indeed the Messiah, then one thing, one fact is, is pretty convincing uh, that he is the Messiah, and I'm sure that Mary believed it. And it's this. She never once had to discipline Jesus while she was raising him. I mean, think about that. Uh, Jesus was perfect. There was no spankings. There was no sitting in the corner, uh, no time out, no taking away his cell phone, right? None of that. Absolutely perfect child. And, and as, a, as a learning parent, as a, as a still fresh, trying to figure it out parent, uh, I can tell you that I love my baby girl. She is awesome, 13-month-old. Uh, and she is amazing, but she is a dirty, rotten sinner at 13 months. I'm telling you, she will, Emily and I will look right at her and say, don't do that, or no thank you is the thing that we say, no thank you, don't eat the dog's food, uh, no thank you, don't climb up the steps. She'll look right at us, go and grab that dog food and go st start to put it in her mouth and laugh about it. She's a dirty, rotten sinner, right? So, so there's, there's, no, there's no question to me that convincing evidence that Jesus is the Messiah for Mary is that she never had to discipline her son. Okay, He's perfect, absolutely perfect. Uh, no, no need to, to argue that any further. Jesus being the Messiah wasn't hard for Mary to believe. So why, did, why was she a part of the group that thought he was crazy? Well, it's possible that she was one of the family members that thought Jesus was crazy, um, but only because he wasn't eating. Uh, I mean, who, who really knows? But what, what good mom... Uh, what does every good mom say to their child whenever they're away? Uh, have you been getting enough to eat? Uh, ha have you been eating enough? Uh, what have you been eating? You know, I've heard, I heard this several times from my mother until she saw me uh, post-marriage, and she, she knows that I'm getting plenty to eat. Uh, and, and, but that's what moms do, right? Motherly instinct. Okay? We can't say for sure. I don't know that that's the case. But it's likely, my point is, it's likely that Mary's not in the group that thinks Jesus is crazy because of what he is saying. Okay? It's not because of what he's saying. However, there were certainly members of Jesus' family who were part of the first group, the oblivious. Okay? Now, obviously, Jesus' family knew who he was. His half-brothers knew who he was. This was his family. They knew Jesus better than most. Okay? Jesus' half-brothers spent their lives looking up to their older brother. Okay? Uh, they spent their lives maybe envying Jesus or being jealous of Jesus because they continued to receive discipline for their screw-ups. And they saw Jesus over here as, as the, the model child that never did anything. Never saw him experience discipline because he didn't need to be disciplined, right? These half-brothers knew who Jesus was. Uh, they, they sat around the dinner table with Jesus. They, they cracked up laughing at jokes with him. 
Uh, they were tickled by him, entertained by him, uh, played games with him, had conversations with him. Uh, there's no question that Jesus' family knew the person of Jesus. Okay? But as we see by this passage, knowing who Jesus is is not enough. His family knew who he was, but upon hearing that Jesus and his disciples were being impressed upon by the crowd, so much so that they didn't have time or even space to eat, they went on to rescue their brother. Okay? But not in a heroic, save him from the crowd kind of way. Rather, they went to save Jesus from himself. Okay? You see, Jesus' family thought Jesus was a lunatic. They thought he was nuts. They thought he had lost his mind. Uh, they, they thought that uh, he had lost his mind and that it wasn't because he wasn't eating. Okay? That wasn't the straw that broke the camel's back. It wasn't what sent them over the edge. Jesus is acting kind of funny. Oh, he's not eating? He's nuts. We've got to go get him. Okay, that wasn't it. Uh, most likely, uh, they, were, they thought he was crazy because of what he was saying to draw these large crowds. It was probably because he claimed to be the Messiah. Okay, so his family tried to save Jesus, but in fact they restrained him from, from his mission. See, Jesus' half-brothers, unlike his mother Mary, uh, didn't actually believe in Jesus as the Messiah until after his resurrection. Okay, a couple of his brothers contributed books to the New Testament, but they didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah until he resurrected. And, and think about this. How many of you would have had a hard time believing that one of your siblings was supposed to be the Savior of the world, uh, no matter how many signs pointed to it? You know, I'm in that camp. Uh, I, I mean, it's not a fair comparison, because my sister saw me screw up plenty when I was younger, not even close to looking like a Messiah. Uh, but the last person on the bandwagon of Mark the Messiah would be my sister. You know, uh, she is not going to jump on that bandwagon no matter what signs point to it. Uh, it it's just not going to happen. It's not that she doesn't love me. She just knows who I am, right? She, she knows me. It, it's the same with Jesus' family. It's not, that, it's not that they didn't have overwhelming evidence that Jesus is the Messiah. Uh, it's not that they, they couldn't have looked back on his life and said, yeah, these things add up. He's the Messiah. It's not that they didn't love Jesus. It was just hard for them to fathom uh, a family member of theirs being the Savior of the world because their exposure to Jesus desensitized them to who he really was. Today's modern equivalent to Jesus' uh, family is the people who grew up in church. Okay, so those of us who grew up in church uh, could be a danger in falling into the same category. And here's a disclaimer. If you stop listening to this message within the next few minutes, which I hope you don't, uh, I don't want you to hear me say that you should remove your kids from church and you should stop coming uh, for fear that they will grow up and become like Jesus' half-brothers, right? Overexposed and desensitized to Jesus. Uh, don't do that. Continue to be faithful in church. Uh, continue to be faithful in raising your children in Christ. Continue to be faithful in teaching them God's word both here and getting them in church so they can hear it here as well, or at home. Uh, it is not being in church that's the problem. But this is exactly what we see happen sometimes. Uh, there are a lot of people in churches today that if they actually read what the Scripture said and, and listened and thought about what Jesus did and said, they would think Jesus is a lunatic too. Okay? But they grew up in church, so they know who Jesus is. They know most of the stories, etc. But for many, it never becomes anything more than just knowledge because they are desensitized to the work of Jesus. They aren't in awe of what Jesus has done. If Jesus' family had thought back on the fact that Jesus was not just a goody two-shoes, but that he never screwed up, he never got mad at mom and dad, uh, he, he never lied, always made his bed, etc., they may have realized that it was possible that Jesus was who he claimed to be, and that he would have, they would have been in awe of him. Right? It would have maybe convinced them that he was the Messiah. Well, in the same way, if we as Christians in our churches would, would stop just teaching information about Jesus, uh, we would start pointing to how wonderful Jesus is and all that he accomplished on our behalf so that we may live eternally with him. If we would start focusing on the, the greatness of who Jesus is as our Lord, we would help fight against the oblivious. Uh, we'd help keep that from being a part of our church and a part of our households. If we would focus on who Christ really is and his purpose. See, proximity to Jesus does not always translate to passion for Jesus. This is proven by Jesus' family and reiterated in our churches. Uh, don't be oblivious to the glory of the Messiah who is right in front of you. 
Unfortunately, Jesus' family members weren't the only ones oblivious to what was right in front of them, and that brings us to our next group of people, the defiant. Uh, see, there was another group of people who traveled to come to see Jesus. Uh, this group did not have the best relationship with Jesus either, just like Jesus' half-brothers. Uh, and it was the religious leaders who had quickly become enemies of Jesus. These guys had one mission when they traveled from Jerusalem to find Jesus, and that was to take him down. Right? And, and think about this. When, when Jesus was the new guy on the block, again, the religious leaders, they are looking for the Messiah. They, they want the Messiah. They think they want the Messiah to come. Right? Their image of the Messiah, they want that. They, they're waiting for this to happen, right? And so they're, Jesus, new guy on the block, they see him doing these things. They, he, he's definitely uh, got a handle on Scripture. They think this might be the guy. It's, it's possible that this is the guy, right? They see him do some of these miracles. They start murmuring. We finally found the Messiah. He's going to love me. Hey, this guy is going to love me. I am so stinking good, okay? That's what the, that's what the religious leaders are saying. And then they see Jesus perform these miracles. They're like, oh, baby, this is it. This is the guy. But then Jesus tells the paralytic man that his sins are forgiven instead of simply telling him to get up off his mat and walk. And they're like, uh-oh. Okay, maybe not. Let's pump the brakes a little bit. And then Jesus teaches about the Sabbath. And he teaches about the Sabbath in such a way that contradicts what they teach about the Sabbath. And it goes against what they're doing. And he says, you people are wrong. And then he heals a man on the Sabbath, so he's doing work on the Sabbath and breaking their Sabbath law. And these guys are like, yeah, <laughs> this is not the guy. He has got to go. And I don't know who he thinks he is, but we have got to get rid of this guy. Okay? So their opinion of Jesus did a complete 180. And so by this point in Mark's gospel, they are they're bent on one thing, and that is eliminating Jesus. He can no longer be a threat to what we have going on. So... Like anybody who initially finds themselves in a tough, tough predicament and, and wanting an immediate out, they, they started to get these irrational thoughts. Uh, and, and what you've got to understand is um, these religious leaders, uh, the, the defiant religious leaders, they knew the power of Jesus. Okay, so they knew that they were in a tough spot. Uh, they, they knew that they weren't going to be able to discount the miracles that Jesus had done. Right? And so they were starting to, to panic and had this irish, irrational thought. Uh, they, had, they had witnessed these miracles. They had seen Jesus uh, heal the crippled man. They, they had seen him uh, tell the paralytic man to walk up, uh, to stand up and walk. They had seen him heal many sick people, cast out many demons. His power was absolutely undeniable. So instead, they didn't try to deny his power. They devised a plan on their, on their trip from Jerusalem, probably, uh, that they were going to discredit Jesus, Right? How are we going to discredit Jesus? We have to discredit Jesus. So this is their plan. I imagine they didn't give it a whole lot of thought. Uh, it, this is like something uh, absolutely ridiculous that I would expect from a middle schooler, maybe. Uh, this is what happened. Whenever they got there, they arrived on the scene, and this is what they say to Jesus. Jesus is possessed by Satan. Right? Are you kidding me? They actually accused Jesus of being Satan-possessed and said that that's where he gets the power to cast out demons. And what kind of off-the-wall statement, logical reasoning is that? Jesus and the religious leaders, again, throughout the Gospels, they had many run-ins, and the religious leaders uh, challenged Jesus numerous times. But this has got to be the most ridiculous and outrageous of them all. Uh, Jesus simply says, real simple answer, how can Satan cast out Satan? Why would Satan be against Satan? And Jesus' argument is easy, uh, but frankly, it's one of the most amazing arguments for the defense of Jesus as the Messiah. Uh, if you're into apologetics and, and, and you want to defend Jesus as the Savior, uh, look no further than this passage. You have to at least include this passage. If it is documented that the group of people who hated Jesus the most couldn't deny his power over sickness, his power over creation, and his power over even demons... Uh, if they couldn't deny that to the point that their knee-jerk defense or attempt to tear down his reputation was to just accuse Jesus of being Satan himself, then how can anyone deny that Jesus is the Christ? How can anyone deny that Jesus is the Messiah? Uh, Jesus' defense of their accusation takes parable form. Uh, he, takes, he asks the question, Who is powerful enough to enter the house of a strong man like Satan and plunder his goods? And then he answers saying, only someone who is stronger. Someone who is strong enough to bind the strong man so that he can then enter the house and take the things from his home. 
Jesus is making a very profound statement with this parable. And while the defiant religious leaders are accusing Jesus of being Satan, Jesus is saying not only is he not Satan, but he's more powerful than Satan. Well, who is more powerful than Satan? God's more powerful than Satan. So Jesus is making the statement that I am God. I am more powerful than Satan. I am strong enough to bind up the strong man, come into his house, and plunder his goods. Okay? How can Jesus be possessed by Satan? He's doing the work that is so destructive to Satan because he's liberating people, saving them, uh, the people that have been enslaved in bondage to Satan for so many years. Jesus is exercising his power and authority over Satan in Satan's house, in Satan's dominion. Okay? And Jesus is communicating that this is not something that, that Satan himself is fond of. Okay? He's been bound, and, and I'm in control. I'm, I'm taking over uh, this, this realm, and I'm reclaiming what's mine. Jesus is saying that he is the, strong, the stronger of the two men. Okay? So the defiant don't like what they're hearing. Jesus is telling them that, that they are wrong again. Okay? Again, they're, being, they're told that they're wrong. They, they, and they can't fathom that. They're proud men. And so he's also using uh, their blind statement to lay a solid foundation for being the Messiah. Not only is he telling them they're wrong, but he's using their claim to further establish and have a stronger argument for being the Messiah. How frustrating is that? Have you ever been in an argument with somebody and they use your argument against you? It's frustrating. Okay? I've been there. The reason why I call these, these religious leaders the defiant is because when staring the truth right in their face, they still refuse to accept it. Again, Jesus is making a, a beyond arguable defense for being the Christ, and they refuse to accept it. Our modern equivalent for this today is uh, world religionists, okay? other religions. Uh, and I originally put atheists on here, but that, that doesn't, that's not broad enough, okay? because it's not just people who don't believe in God. It's anybody who's not accepted Christ as their Savior. Uh, because anyone who hasn't accepted Christ has rejected the truth that is staring them in the face. And the overwhelming evidence that Jesus is the Savior of the world is written all throughout Scripture. And for those who haven't been exposed to Scripture, Paul says that it's even written all throughout creation. God testifies to himself through his own creation. We are all without excuse. So God, the creator of the universe, he exists and he desires a relationship with us. He desires to be glorified by God and he provided a way for those things to happen. You don't have to look far to see that it is true. And if someone denies that it is, they are just being defiant like the religious leaders. Uh, before we move on to our final point uh, and leave the defiant, I, I do need to address what I consider considered at one point in time one of the most scariest verses in all of Scripture, and that's the unforgivable sin. Uh, Jesus says, But anyone who blasphemes the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. This is a sin with eternal consequences. And as I, as I thought about that, I thought all sin has eternal consequences, right? Uh, it's just a matter of whether it's covered by the blood of Christ or not. Um, but when I was a young boy or maybe a middle schooler, I remember reading this verse, and, and I got nervous. I got scared. I wanted to weep, right? I, I was confused because I was told Jesus forgives all sins, no matter how bad they are, right? And I, and I had faith in Jesus and experienced that forgiveness of sin. But when I read this verse, I was worried. I started racking through my brain trying to figure out if I had ever blasphemed the Holy Spirit. But I didn't even know what blasphemy meant, so I had to go and look it up. And it's, it's to talk about God or religion in a way that shows disrespect. So, I'm thinking, okay, I have definitely probably spoken in vain about God, and, and, and that's disrespectful. Uh, and I'm certain that I had probably been flippant about church or God at some point in my life, so... Uh, I'm, I'm guilty of blasphemy, but I couldn't remember ever doing it against the Holy Spirit specifically. So I thought, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm good. Whew. God has forgiven all my other sins, this one hasn't happened yet, so I'm, I'm in the clear. Right? Well, that's not what he's saying. Okay? That's not what Jesus is talking about. Blaspheming the Holy Spirit is something that the defiant do. Okay? It's something that, the many, uh, that many of the religious leaders had done. It's rejecting God. It's rejecting Jesus as God in spite of its truth and its overwhelming evidence. Hebrews 4, uh, 6, 4 through 6 explains it this way. For it is impossible to bring back to repentance those uh, who were once enlightened, those who have experienced the good things of heaven and shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the power of the age to come, and who then turn away from God. It is impossible to bring such people back to repentance 
By rejecting the Son of God, this is important, by rejecting the Son of God, they themselves are nailing him to the cross once again and holding him to, up to public shame. Okay, John MacArthur says of those who blaspheme the Holy Spirit, they are those who have been fully exposed to the truth of the gospel and yet walk away from Christ in spite of the overwhelming evidence that they have been given. That is why it is an eternal sin, because no forgiveness is possible for those who refuse to stop rejecting Christ. Okay? Those who blaspheme the Holy Spirit, they don't want repentance. They don't want forgiveness. They have rejected Christ. They don't want anything to do with Him. And that's why it is a sin with eternal consequences, because all sin has eternal consequences. It's whether or not it's covered by the blood of Christ. Those who blaspheme the Holy Spirit, they don't, they don't want God's grace. They've rejected Jesus. Okay? So if you've heard this scripture for the first time and immediately were uncomfortable as I was when I was younger, or if you have dwelt on this scripture before and you weren't sure what to do with it, take heart. Those who are afraid that they've blasphemed the Holy Spirit, that's good. That's your, that's your conscience telling you that you've done something wrong or you've you're guilty, right? Uh, those, so those of you who think that you have have not gone to the point of unforgiveness. It's those who don't care if they have that will not experience the grace of God uh, that, that Jesus, uh, through Jesus, uh, that the defiant in Christ will face. So, uh, finally, the third group, the family. As if the interactions to this point have not been loaded enough with uh, shock factor, the third one keeps the hits coming. Again, Jesus' family comes into the scene and asks for Jesus, right? So they ask for Jesus, and they say, hey, you know, send Jesus out to, out to me. We want to talk to him. And Jesus says to the crowd, you are my family, right? The crowd says, your family's out here, Jesus. He says, you are my family. Now, before you go thinking how rude Jesus was in saying this, it's not meant to be a slight on Jesus' family, okay? As we've already covered you know the state of most of Jesus' family. Besides his mother, Mary, his half-brothers don't believe that he's the Messiah. Okay? It's not that Jesus doesn't have time for his family. It's not that Jesus doesn't love his family. It's not that Jesus didn't want to give the time to go out and talk to his family. Right? He wasn't being rude. Jesus just saw an opportunity. He recognized an opportunity and used it to point to who his true family is, what really matters, what relationships are truly important. Okay? And I actually teach this to students on a fairly regular basis, not, not this passage specifically, but this concept. Uh, I think it's important for young people, especially middle school and high schoolers, uh, at the age uh, where acceptance and, and feeling like they're part of something is so important to them, I think it's important for them to know that they should be spending their time uh, where they should be spending their time, rather who they should be spending their time with, right? And that's their family, uh, but not necessarily flesh and blood family, Rather, they're family in Christ. Uh, I'm not dissing time with family. I'm not dissing get together, family get-togethers, family reunions. We're going up in, in August to, to see family members and see uh, more little babies. It's, it's great. Blood family is great. I've got great relationships with my family. I'm not dissing that. Okay? They are important. But none of that is as important as our familial relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Jesus points to the crowd and calls them his family because those who do the will of God or those who have accepted him as Savior have been adopted as sons and daughters of God and co-heirs with Christ. So what's the difference between Jesus' half-brothers and the, the crowd that's sitting around Jesus? Well, these people know the purpose of Christ. Jesus' half-brothers know the person of Christ. These people know the purpose of Christ. Okay? Uh, Jesus' half-brothers may have known who Jesus was from the time that they were kids, but they lacked the understanding of why Jesus was there. Okay? The crowd knew that Jesus was the Messiah. He was the chosen one of God, uh, sent to defeat sin and death and pay the ransom for their sins. And it is because of this that they desired Jesus' presence. Okay? True family members, true family members of God, desire Jesus' presence. We get that in many different ways. right? We can be in Jesus' presence by, by going to the Lord in prayer. Or, or we can receive Jesus' presence by spending quiet time in God's Word and diving into God's Word and getting to know Him intimately as He has revealed Himself to us through His Word. Okay? We, can, we can be in Jesus' presence, or we can uh, experience His presence through time in church, right? being taught the Word of God, uh, and through time with God's family, uh, th those who have put their faith in Him. This is what I teach the students. The time with God's family is priceless, and it needs to be a priority. 
We need to spend time with our church family, and we need to do so outside of church, not just on Sundays and Wednesdays. Uh, your your check-in time with your family isn't just Sundays and Wednesdays, but it's throughout the week. We need to encourage one another. We need to pray with and for one another. We need to check in on a regular basis. I mean, think about how you interact with your biological family. Uh, for most of you, if you have good relationships with them, you know what's going on in their lives, right? Uh, you know what they're into. You get into their business. You, you make sure that they're doing okay. You talk to them more than once a month, maybe. Um, well, guess what? God has designed us to do the same with our family in Christ. More important than the bonds of our human blood is the bonds of the blood of Christ. Right? And so we need to be doing the same thing. We need to be in each other's business. We need to be calling each other to a higher standard of living. We need to be encouraging one another. We need to know what's going on in one another's lives. Our modern equivalent of this is the same as it was when it was written. Uh, Jesus' family are genuine Christ followers. Jesus says those who do the will of God are his brothers and sisters and mother. Those who genuinely follow him, those who desire his presence, are in the family of God. Uh, notice who's on the outside of the house here. Okay? Uh, you th generally the house, you think about a house housing a family. Guess, guess who's on the inside of the house? It's the crowd. It's those who know the purpose of Jesus. It's those who put their faith in him. And on the outside are those who haven't. It's those who aren't part of the family. Yes, they're part of Jesus' biological family, but, but they're on the outside because they, they don't know the purpose of Jesus. Okay. As I wrap up, I just, I just want to challenge you to think about a few things. I want to challenge you to think about how you relate with Jesus. Are you one of the oblivious? Uh, you know, uh, you know, Jesus by name, maybe you know the stories, but you aren't clear on the purpose of Christ, right? You grew up in church, you've been exposed to him, but have you been desensitized to him? Or are you the defiant? Uh, you know and have seen the power of Christ, and you know that there is something special about him, but you have rejected him up to this point in your life, right? You've seen him work in people's lives, you've seen him change people's lives, but you continue to reject him. Or are you a family member of Jesus? You've accepted Christ as your Savior, and you're seeking his presence in any way you can get it. Well, if you're one of the first two groups, uh, I pray that you be honest with yourself about where you stand with him or how you're relating with him. Whether you have been in church your whole life, again, and you know who Jesus is, you know all the stories, uh, but if you were honest, you'd liken yourself with his half-brothers who were just desensitized to Jesus. Or whether you're in the second group and, and uh, you're someone who knows the truth, but you're looking, for, you're looking for answers elsewhere. God brought you here for a reason. You are here today for a reason, and I pray that he is working on your heart. Uh, don't deny the prompting of the Spirit for another day. Submit your life to Jesus and follow him. That's what you're being called to. If you're already part of Jesus' family, great. Praise the Lord. But I challenge you to think about your involvement with his family. Okay? Uh, do you keep members of his family at arm's length? Are you actively seeking their presence? Are you seeking the presence of family members in order to encourage them and be encouraged in your walk with Christ? Uh, do you find yourself on the outside, isolated from Jesus and his family members? Or are you on the inside? Are you plugged in? Are you being intentional with your interactions with the church family? Uh, plug in. Plug into your church family. Plug into those uh, who, who are also co-heirs with Christ, who are adopted into God's family. As Christians, we're not perfect, but, but Christ followers are often an untapped resource in the sanctification process. God desires to use each other to help one another grow and become more like him. Uh, be, be involved in the family. Be all in with the family. Whatever it is that you're dealing with today, uh, take some time to deal with it. Don't leave here without dealing with it. Don't just shove it off. Don't waste time. You came here for a reason. Uh, deal with it, whether it's by coming up here in a minute uh, or just right there in your seat. Make sure you deal with it. But let's make sure that we leave here today more like Jesus than when we came. Okay, so I'm going to pray. The band's going to come up here. We're going to sing a great song. But make sure that if you have business to do with the Lord, you're, you're getting it taken care of. Uh, and if you do, uh, invite your family members to be a part of it. At least Pastor Andrew will be down front. Come talk to him. Uh, I'll see you at the door. Okay, so let's pray. God, I thank you again for the opportunity to uh, praise and worship you this morning. Thank you for your word. I thank you for giving us uh, an eternal family, uh, a family that uh, will not pass, uh, Father, but will just continue to grow 
Uh, and on the day that you return, we'll be united with all our family members. And I, I thank you for that. And I, I pray that we would be intentional about um, about spending time with one another and being being intentional in the way we interact with one another so we can uh, call each other to uh, live the way you desire us to live. We can be encouraged with by one another whenever we're going through difficult times. Uh, Father, and, and, and I pray that that would be the case. I pray that we would relate well with you uh, as, as the third group, as, as the crowd that is with you. And Father, if there's anyone here today uh, who ha- who is oblivious to who you are no matter how long they've been exposed to you. Father, or if there's anyone here today who is who is defiant uh, in front of you, they know the truth, they know your power, but they've rejected you. Father, I pray that you'd soften their hearts and the Spirit would work and they'd accept you as Savior today. Uh, we love you. So I pray. Amen. Great. 